The Subcommittee on Environment will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, Restoring U.S. Leadership in Weather Forecasting. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witness panels. And I'd now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. First, let me say, uh, diverting from prepared comments for just a little bit, uh, that our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Oklahoma. That, and I think this tragedy highlights the importance of real-time forecasting to protecting lives and property. I'd like to thank our excellent witness panels as well for traveling here today. And while this hearing was scheduled several weeks ago to discuss draft legislation to help enhance weather forecasting, the tragedy in Oklahoma once again underscores the importance of this issue and should encourage us to start tackling these questions today. It's unfortunate that the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration is unable to testify in person. However, as the ranking member and I have just discussed, we will be asking uh, Acting Administrator Kathy Sullivan to submit comments for the record, and we will work to accommodate her in-person testimony at, uh, on these issues sometime very soon. We need a world-class system of weather prediction in the United States. One, as the National Academy of Sciences recently put it, that is second to none. We can thank the hard-working men and women of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and their partners throughout the weather enterprise for the great strides that have been made in forecasting in recent decades. But the reality is, is that we can do better. And it's not enough to blame failures on programming or sequestration or lack of resources. As more Oklahoma has demonstrated, we have to do better. But the good news is that we can. Superstorm Sandy made clear that many of the weather community have known for years. Our model for weather prediction has fallen behind Europe and other parts of the world in predicting weather events in the United States. The Weather Forecasting Improvement Act draft language our witnesses will be discussing today would build upon the down payment made by Congress following this storm toward restoring the U.S. as a leader in the field through expanded community com computing capacity and data assimilation techniques. The people of Moore, Oklahoma received a tornado warning 16 minutes before the twisters struck their town. Tornado forecasting is difficult, but lead times for storms have become gradually better. The draft legislation would prioritize investments in technologies like multi-phased raid radar, technology being developed in NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory in Oklahoma, which has, and I'm quoting, the potential to provide revolutionary improvements in tornado warning, lead times, and accuracy, reducing false alarms, close quote, and could move us toward the goal of being able to warn on forecast. We've seen the devastating effects that severe weather can have in this country. And this bill would establish a priority mission for all of NOAA to improve forecasts and warnings to protect lives and property. Recent studies suggest that even routine weather variability every year can have an impact on a large portion of the economy with hundreds of billions of dollars in consequences. The Weather Forecasting Improvement Act is based upon a number of recommendations received in the last Congress. And let me tell you what this bill will do. As a country faces severe satellite data gaps, it would encourage NOAA to systematically conduct cost-benefit assessments to ensure that we are getting the most bang for our buck in acquiring and procuring a mix of critical space, air, and ground-based observational data. As Dr. Marion Moore, director of the National Weather Center at the University of Oklahoma, explained in, to this subcommittee, NOAA needs to do a better job of conducting quantitative assessments on data use, cost, and value. This draft would help remove barriers to NOAA's cooperation with parts of the weather enterprise, including upstream data options and downstream value-added forecasting capabilities from a private sector. As David Crane, president and CEO of GeoMetWatch, a company looking to develop critical sounding observations from a constellation of sta satellites stated that a commercial approach can provide the data needed years earlier and with minimal cost and risk. It would balance NOAA's research portfolio by emphasizing weather research with the potential to protect lives and property. In 2012, NOAA barely spent one-third of the resources on weather research as it did on climate research. And finally, the language would dedicate resources tra to transitioning next-generation research into operational forecasting. As NOAA's Scientific Advisory Board stated last month, unless science is transitioned into operations, NOAA will fail in this mission. 
Unfortunately, no one was unable to testify in person this morning, but we will be providing the subcommittee with comments, I'm sorry, but they will be providing the subcommittee with comments on forecasting improvements, and we look forward to their feedback informing this legislation and their future testimony on this and other topics. I look forward to discussing the absolute critical issue with our witnesses today and learning how we can restore U.S. leadership in weather forecasting. And with that, I yield my time and recognize the ranking member, uh, Ms. Bonamici, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Stewart, and welcome to our witnesses, Mr. Myers and Mr. Kirshner. I want to thank you for appearing here today to provide your insights regarding weather data and weather forecasting. I join the chairman in saying that our thoughts and prayers go out to all the victims of the powerful and devastating tornado that just days ago swept through the state of Oklahoma. All of us have been moved by this event and the courageous efforts of the community. The event is a painful reminder that we're all vulnerable to unexpected disasters and it also highlights how critical the work of the National Weather Service is as a public safety tool. <clears throat> and that leads us to the purpose of today's hearing. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, has an expansive mission to predict the weather, to ensure healthy oceans and fisheries, to address climate mitigation and adaptation, and to enhance the resilience of our coastal communities and economies. To carry out all of these missions, NOAA must manage a very broad set of scientific challenges and look for ways to incorporate the findings of research into the daily lives of all of our citizens. In recent years, our nation has experienced harsher climactic conditions in a wave of severe weather. From un unprecedented heat waves and droughts to severe record-breaking weather events across this country, we've received constant reminders of the importance of accurate and timely weather prediction. Good weather prediction, however, doesn't just happen. It requires collection of the appropriate data, and our understanding of what is useful evolves over time. It also requires us to conduct scientific research to understand the physical processes that drive short and long-term weather conditions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unfortunately, the draft legislation we're considering today includes little or no acknowledgement of NOAA's other missions carried out by the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, particularly with regard to its climate and ocean research. Although my colleagues across the dais might not always agree on every issue around climate and ocean science, Sacrificing these critical areas will only weaken us for the future. Understanding the climate is as critical to public protection as understanding the weather. It is unfortunate that NOAA could not be here today. They received 10 days ago on May 13th a letter from the chairman. It's my understanding that a copy of the draft bill was given to the agency at that time. That did not give them uh, enough time for the agency to evaluate a bill, compose testimony, and then clear testimony through OMB. Also, I want to point out that NOAA just released their Weather Ready Nation Roadmap last month after they spent more than a year preparing the report and seeking public input. Additionally, there have been four outside reviews of NWS, NOAA, and, R and NWS and NOAA R&D in the last year, two by the National Academies of Science, one by the National Academy of Public Administration, and one done for the NOAA Science Advisory Board. These reports address key issues like how to move from research to operation, the need for NOAA to more actively tap the modeling and forecasting expertise in the research community, and the divisions within NWS and between NWS and OAR. The draft legislation does not address all of these relevant issues, but they need to be considered. It would be both appropriate and beneficial for this subcommittee to receive testimony about these reports before we move to mark up a bill. We can work together in this area if we have complete information, which requires a more complete committee record than today's hearing will yield. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I indicated to the chairman, the minority submits that the importance of weather forecasting and the work of NOAA are so important that we are invoking a Rule 11 right to ask for a second day of witnesses, and I'm attaching that letter to uh, to my statement for inclusion in the record, and I appreciate the chairman's cooperation in that regard. I'm sure we can work together, Mr. Chairman, to find a date and time and a range of expert witnesses who can help us craft strong legislation that will improve weather forecasting for the nation. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee members in this critically important area. Thank you very much again for appearing before us, and I look forward to an informative discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. And regarding your request, uh, once you've provided us with the written request, we'll certainly review it, and we look forward to working with you on that. 
Okay, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Mr. Barry Myers, Chief Executive Officer for AccuWeather Incorporated. He previously served as AccuWeather's Executive Vice President and General Counsel. Mr. Myers has served as Special Advisor to three separate directors of the National Weather Service and is a professional member of the American Meteorological Society. He also currently serves as the Environmental Information Services Working Group for NOAA Science Advisory Board. Our next witness today is Mr. John Kirchner, President and Chief Operation Operating Officer of GeoOptics. Previously, Mr. Kirchner has held senior executive positions for large satellite communication companies, Rural Space and Communications, and Archiva Satellite and Media. Mr. Kirchner has worked to develop long-term space-based infrastructure for data networking, earth observations and sensing, and information management systems. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. And I now recognize Mr. Myers for five minutes to present his testimony. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today and to the families and friends of those who lost loved ones on Monday in Oklahoma and to those who suffered injury and, and other loss, I can only offer my condolences and a hope that today's hearing will contribute to improved warnings of uh, severe weather. The United States has the most violent and challenging weather on earth. Tornadoes and hurricanes, lightning and hail, snow and ice and floods, to name few. The United States has more tornadoes than any nation. In fact, we have four times the number that all of Europe has. On Monday, NOAA's National Weather Service provided about 16 minutes of warning before the tornado touched down and actually over 30 minutes before it reached more. The agency and the people of the National Weather Service did an outstanding job. There can be no doubt without those warnings the toll would have been much worse. Uh, Mike Smith in his book Warnings points out the huge progress made in tornado forecasting since the 1950s. But we can and must do more relative to severe weather. People should not live in fear in America's heartland, in its cities, and along its coasts. With enhanced modeling, perhaps we might have known hours in advance exactly where the tornado would form, where it would touch down, how monstrous it would grow, and its exact path. Imagine being able to tell people an hour or two in advance to move out of the zone of danger and have them watch the tornado from miles away. Is it a pipe dream? This year marks the 50th anniversary of AccuWeather's creation. 50 years ago, weather forecasting was more art than science. A tornado might form at night in the darkness unknown to those in its deadly path and no radar was there to help a forecaster spot a hook echo. A storm like Hurricane Sandy without a weather satellite would have thought to have moved away out into the ocean only to return as a surprise. Much like the great Galveston hurricane of 1900 that no one knew was coming because there were no eyes in the sky. In the United States, the National Weather Service and America's weather industry and the academic and research communities each have important and complementary roles to play. It's a unique and special partnership and a benefit to the nation. The United States government collects and disseminates data from local and remote sensing platforms, runs forecast models, and prepares and makes special warnings. Weather companies and academic and research institutions use this information and also collect and disseminate data and make weather forecasts and warnings, some specific and tailored and some for the general public. The joint system of public and private cooperation helps to save countless lives and prevent hundreds of millions of dollars in property damage a year in the United States. In fact, it has a name, the Public-Private Partnership. And it has been held up as a model by other federal agencies and even a recent executive order mentioned it uh, this month. In 1962, if I had told anyone that a company named AccuWeather 
By 2008, with tell a manufacturing facility in Mississippi, a thousand miles away, 21 minutes in advance, that a tornado was headed right at it, and that they needed to shelter their people, and that the private weather warning would save 88 lives in a single electronic message, it would have not been believed. But it, in similar situations, have happened now repeatedly. The government is uniquely positioned to ensure and enhance the provision of weather data and the issuance of warnings for the public aimed at the protection of life and property. These activities require research and development, transfer of knowledge uh, between government agencies and the private sector. And this is needed with regard to advanced radar technologies, aerial observation systems, high performance computing networks, advanced forecast modeling, and other government appropriate activities. We all need to protect this core functionality and the research that keeps the entire American weather enterprise ahead of the curve. A special focus during Superstorm Sandy was the ECMWF, so-called European model, which did a better job at some points in the storm track than US models did. This gap presents issues from an economic, safety, and national security standpoint. Relying on other countries for better weather models places America in a weak and subservient position. Weather research and development and the creation and operation of core infrastructure remain a matter of national government urgency, which the Weather Forecasting Improvement Act will help to address. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Kirchner. Chairman Stewart, Ranking Member Bonamici, and distinguished members of the su subcommittee, it is indeed the first time I've been to a hearing such as this, and it's a privilege for me to present, to be present here today and provide you testimony in the absence of my colleague and our CEO, uh, Vice Admiral Conrad Lautenbacher, uh, former NOA, uh, NOAA Administrator. The Admiral sends his regards and uh, regrets his inability to be here today. We also pass on our own con our condolences and thoughts um, with uh, those in Oklahoma as well. The U.S. weather forecasting capabilities are in need of repair and attention not solely because of technical shortcomings, inadequate computer power, or deficient weather models, but also because of the explosive growth and the cost of acquiring critical weather data with, from satellites and the resulting significant delays in new satellite programs. The traditional methods of the collection for the collection of satellite data effectively block new instruments in more potent, lower cost and proven data sensing instruments. The net effect is damaging our nation's ability to keep pace in weather observations and predictions. A transition of the weather data acquisition community to 21st century methods, both technical and economic, is overdue and our weather dependent economy depends on it. The genius of American innovation and initiative has had technical and market solutions to the weather data crisis at the ready for many years. As analogs, a few working cases from related sectors already exist. At NASA, instead of operating a fleet of costly space shuttles, NASA has contracted with the private sector for its payload needs and works with cooperatively with other governments. The commercial satellite-based communications industry provides the government 80% of its bandwidth globally. The commercial satellite-based imagery industry also provides government much of the imagery outside of the intelligence community application. With these analogs in mind, the focus would be better placed on achieving data quality, accuracy, and excellence from wherever that data may come, rather than necessarily owning that data infrastructure. The added irony is that the costs of technologies of every kind have plummeted over the last 20 years, except not seemingly in the wider space domain. Tragically, the benefits of mobile and miniaturized technologies that we all carry in our pockets are seemingly sheltered from the critical space mission of forecasting weather. Geooptics, our company, will advance a small satellite cellular-like observation mo obser observing model that starts with GPS radio occultation. We believe an integrated private company can deploy such systems for a fraction over current cost to government. Geooptics, working with private sector partners and the science community, can realize uncommon efficiencies to deliver path-breaking science speedily at bargain prices for the public good and lower government's cost for satellite weather data. We want to emphasize that today, our government, and as a consequence, our economy and citizens, is facing a weather data crisis that can be relieved almost immediately through procurement reform that would unleash the resource, resourcefulness and the ingenuity of American private enterprise. In doing so, the government will foster a vibrant and innovative 
free market in satellite weather data, creating a new weather data economy that will be supported by weather data security, that will once again stock our shelves with the best possible weather products and services. In sum, we highlight some of the following comments regarding the bill and in, just in general recommendations. In section three regarding forecasting innovation, it mentions little to, regarding the general principle of the role of commercial private sources of innovation or the potential role of public-private partnerships. It could. Section six regarding Aussies do not, does not mention the potential role of the private sector or scientific university sources of research to support these efforts, which it also could. In section eight, we believe that overall procurement reform is needed. Elements of this re reform could include shift the focus of federal agencies and users away from the ownership of weather data infrastructure, open competition to acquire the best, most effective, and lowest cost efficient data. Government could articulate, or should articulate, and implement procurement reform by creating new performance-based pay-on-delivery data purchase procurement models that enable federal agencies to immediately contract for services that they need now from private companies that can provide them. This approach will energize capital for private held companies and aid in rapid deployment of needed products and services. Establish specific programs within NOAA and the Air Force and possibly other agencies with budget authority beginning in FY15. We recommend satellite data purchase line items of 10 million each for NOAA and Air Force in 15, growing to 50 million uh, for each by 2020, accompanied by RFQs and or BAAs soliciting proposals. These recommendations and actions are necessary to ensure that the U.S. is never again lagging behind any country or consortium of countries in weather prediction or forecasting. Opening up the government through changes to procurement to very economical, proven, and reliable data sources that meet the standards and specifications of NOAA, Air Force, and other users will be the act that infuses in innovation and creativity into our nation's weather enterprise. The results of this change to the weather enterprise will not only enhance public safety through better forecasting, but will also feed our economy and society with an important source of jobs and help participants in our economy manage vital risk. Additional examples of geo-optics efforts in small satellite cellularized world are available on our website. Admiral Lautenbacher and I will be happy to provide any follow-up comments needed by the subcommittee. I will, will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirchner. I thank the witnesses for, uh, again, for your testimony, for your uh, dedicated service to your nation. Uh, I remind members of the committee rules limit questioning to five minutes, and the chair will at this point open the round of questionings. Before I do, I ask unanimous consent to recognize Representative Reidenstein with, without ob objection, so ordered. Thank you. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for, uh, for questions. Um, I think your, your testimony illustrates something that I pointed out in my opening <clears throat> comment, and that is that we can do better. And uh, the innovation and the, uh, the technology development that your companies represent is encouraging to us. You know, I've done some scary things in my life. Uh, I was a military B-1 pilot for many years. I do a lot of rock climbing. Uh, heck, I taught uh, six teenagers how to drive. Uh, but I've never been as scared as I was one night in Texas when we lived in the plains of Texas and then a storm around us and to hear the tornado warning siren go off. It's a, a terrifying and helpless feeling because there's really not much you can do other than pray that the storm misses you and jump in the bathtub, which isn't very comforting, actually. Uh, you mentioned in, uh, Mr. Myers, you mentioned the 16 minutes uh, warning that we had. And 16 minutes is significant, but I would ask, you know, what, what is our goal? How many minutes could we achieve? How many hours could we actually be able to provide warning? And I ask that hypothetically, but I'd like you to address it, if you could, in your question, and your answer. And then what technologies will allow us to do that? And, and then I'd like to follow up with Superstorm Sandy, if I could, recognizing that the technologies for tornado uh, warning is quite different than for hurricane warning. So if you could, either one of you, what, what is a realistic goal for us in providing warning to people, and then what technologies will uh, help us get to that? Well, I would uh, uh, suggest that in, in looking at hurricanes and looking at tornadoes, there's a, a, an interesting uh, comparison. Uh, because we uh, can see hurricanes, 
because they're large and they move relatively slowly over large land and sea areas, um, we can evacuate people. In fact, the, the, the prime objective is to determine the, the best path and get people out of the way. Uh, and we see news stories uh, all the time of people who uh, decided they were going to, quote, ride out the storm, and we think that's foolish. With regard to tornadoes, we do the opposite. We expect people to ride out the storms in their, in their bathtubs. Uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, the only reason that that's the case is because we cannot yet scientifically determine far enough in advance the strength, the exact path, the location of, of where a tornado is going to form and where it's going to go. Uh, what we need to strive for is having sufficient lead time so that people can get out of the way. If you're not there, you cannot get hurt. We can't stop the buildings from being destroyed. Uh, what is that lead time? I, I don't know, but it seems to me, you know, an hour, uh, two hours, plenty of time for people to, to get out of the way. The science is not there. I, I don't know uh, how we're going to get it there. I think that's what research is required to do. Mr. Kirchner, do you have anything to add to that? Um, sure. I'm, I'm probably not in the best position to answer what happens, you know, giving a warning uh, minutes before a storm. The technology that we work with is in the polar orbiting, I would call it the longer term forecast realm. But I, I think within a portfolio of capabilities um, and the ability to, to do things faster, irrespective of whether you're right before the storm or days before the storm, the kinds of technologies that we are working with um, have been proven to, in the example of GPSRO, which is the technology that we're for, first and foremost focused on, there are studies that show that a portfolio of GPSRO observations can help four days in advance. It can give you uh, eight hours of additional time ahead of existing methods of forecasting, eight hours. If you go out eight days, it can help with 15 hours of additional time. Now, that's on the long end, but I think within a portfolio of, of predicting and planning for severity um, and uh, weather patterns, anything we can do to be efficient and faster at any part of that time horizon is going to be extremely helpful to weather forecasters. Okay. Mr. Myers, I'd like to come back to you, if I could, and just back up what we started to talk about. Uh, you know, the, uh, knowing that technology is emerging and that we can't predict it exactly till we test it and deploy it, uh, are you, with the current technology that you know as under development or being tested, is it, is it reasonable to say that we could, say, double the warning time from 16 to, say, 30 minutes, give people a half hour or, or, or more than that even? Uh, I think we could. Uh, and, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the 16 minutes was in advance of when that storm actually touched down. People on the far end had more warning uh, because it was on the ground and people knew it was coming. Uh, but as you can see, even, even 30 minutes, which was the case at the, at the far end, is not enough and, and people don't know what to do. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in our business, uh, I mentioned about a, a plant in Mississippi that we protected and we do this all over the country, but we have specific sites that, that we can forecast for with regard to where a tornado is moving in a path. You can't do that publicly because you have large communities and people don't all have shelters and places to go. Right. Uh, so it needs to be enough lead time. You can probably uh, double with, with uh, uh, improvement on current technology quickly. Uh, the lead time has increased significantly in the last 20 years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I'm a, I'm a little bit over my time. Thank you to both of you and uh, to the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Kirshner, you spoke specifically about the bill, so I'm going to ask this question to you, but if Mr. Myers wants to uh, weigh in, that's great, too. Section 2 of the legislation makes weather-related activities the top priority in the planning and management of programs within all relevant line offices. So which of the six NOAA line offices would you consider to be relevant? Um, I, I, that's a level of detail regarding the structure that I'm not acquainted with. I'm, I'm still relatively new to this industry. I've been in this position for about six months. Um, I think the, the 
the portfolio that we address is one, as a company, is one of, of weather data, client, data that serves the operational weather community, the space weather community, as well as the climate community. And to the, to the extent that we can help our, cu our customer um, balance and address those needs, we will respond to that as a service company. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Myers, do you, do you have any opinion about which of the six NOAA line offices would be relevant and would have to prioritize uh, weather-related activities under the legislation? Well, it seems to me the ones that deal with, with weather mostly are, are the National Weather Service, uh, uh, NESDIS, uh, uh, and, and obviously uh, OAR. Um, I, I know I've, I've seen o over time, and I, I, I think that one of the good provisions in the bill is, is the need for the agencies to cooperate, especially the Weather Service, to make sure that they get the kind of research that they think is necessary uh, and that there is a connection between the research that's being done in OAR that is tighter uh, than perhaps we see today. Thank you. Uh, one of the concerns that, <clears throat> that I have, and I know I have other colleagues on this committee who represent coastal areas, uh, and, and in fact, we're, we're having a lot of conversations in our uh, Oregon coast about uh, tsunami evacuation. So we, we're talking about you know, how much warning do we need so that that goes on in a different context. So my constituents rely on the ocean economy for vital jobs in hard hit coastal areas. Uh, without research done by NOAA's Sea Grant program on inv invasive species, for example, without the work of NOAA's cooperative institutes, their livelihoods could be at risk. So if weather forecasting is the top priority in every line office, and this is what we're trying to figure out under the draft proposal, what would happen to the climate and oceans and invasive species programs and all the other work that NOAA does? So I just wanted to pose that question because there's a broad mission at NOAA and uh, we need some clarity about we weather related activities being the top priority in all relevant line offices. I have another question for both of you. The, um, the OAR, Office of Atmospheric Research, which is the subject of much of this bill, has responsibilities that range well outside of weather research. They are, they're also the lead on climate mitigation and adaptation. They do important work on oceans, Great Lakes, invasive species. So some have commented that the division between the weather forecasters and the research done at NWS and the research done at OAR leads to the, the OAR doing work that has no utility for the forecaster. So how do you view the proposal that the weather research be pulled out of OAR and moved to NWS to consolidate all of the weather work in one place? Would you support that? Anything that, that could uh, improve the way in which the research is conducted uh, as it relates to the critical needs of, of improving forecasts to protect life and property, uh, I, I would support. Uh, whether that's the best division, I, I, I can't sit here and, and tell you, but uh, things that move in that direction, I think, are, are, are useful. Mr. Kirshner, do you have an opinion on whether the, what, if the weather research be pulled out of OAR and moved to NWS? Um, we'll echo some of what uh, Mr. Myers just said. From an organizational perspective, it's about being the most effective and efficient in terms of structure. I can't speak to that in terms of how NOAA should operate in that regard. I think the most, the thing that I would say is that there are different functions that the organization plays out. Uh, there are, uh, there's operational weather, which has heavy emphasis coming from NWS. Um, we, we are supportive of all the areas of, of the weather enterprise that um, our data and, and other forms of data will support. Thank you. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, Section 4 directs the Assistant Administrator of OAR in coordination with the Assistant Administrator of Weather Services to issue a plan to restore U.S. leadership in weather modeling, prediction, and forecasting. That plan is supposed to be issued within four, six, excuse me, six months of passage and then annually. Now, I mentioned in my opening statement two reports that the National Academy of Science has done, uh, other reports that have recently been, been done, the what National Weather Service, for example, worked for more than a year on such a plan. So do we need another study? Do we need it annually? If we need another study, why should the assistant administrator be in charge of it? 
I'll, Mr. Kushner? Uh, oh, I'm, uh, see, my time has expired, but uh, if you could do a brief response. Again, I'll just, yeah. not dissimilar to what I said earlier, that, that, that structure and how to organize oneself to meet these needs is, is an area that I'm not going to be able to speak wholly to. Um, we just would look for the best direction as a customer to, to give the market. Thank you, and I see my time has expired. Thank yes, you, thank you. <clears throat> and gentlemen, we recognize that you're not experts on no organization and structure, and that's why we look forward to hearing them from their representative at some time in the future. Okay, we now recognize Mr. Rohrbacher for his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I um, remember when I was uh, about six or seven years old, my family came from North Dakota and we were visiting uh, my uh, uh, mother's sister and it was very dark and there was a storm and there was a radio and the radio said there was a tornado that uh, tornadoes might be happening that night and we felt absolutely helpless. We had no idea and we crawled down. Uh, this is uh, into a uh, cellar where my aunt had all these little jars of the, uh, things that she'd made, jellies and jams and things. We spent the night in this cellar underneath the floor. And uh, that we had no idea where if tornadoes, how close they were, but we knew there were tornadoes, <coughs> tornado uh, warnings out there on the radio. And uh, we have advanced so much, so dramatically since then. Uh, however, it is. We also sat through Hurricane Hazel back in the 1950s. My dad joined the Marine Corps, and we were living in a Marine base down in uh, North Carolina. In fact, we went through two hurricanes at the same um, the same year. I remember. It's pretty incredible, um, gentlemen. There's all this talk about the weather getting worse now than it used to be. Is that experience from your companies and your perspectives? You're around weather all the time. Uh, do we have worse weather now? Is Sandy so much worse than Galveston, as you mentioned, in 1900, which was a horrible loss of life? Or um, are we just more aware of the weather now? Well, Mr. Warbacher, I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer that. I know my grandfather always told me that the winters had gotten much milder, that when he was a boy they were much worse. Um, uh, I think you're thinking of Hurricane Hazel in 1954 and probably Connie and Diane in 1955. Um, yep. And uh, 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 clearly uh, when we see events like Sandy and we see an event like uh, uh, Moore, Oklahoma, uh, we conclude that things are getting getting worse because where we are and what we see tends to influence us, I think, the most. Uh, I don't know that anyone has statistics that, that can demonstrate that that is the case. Uh, but I, as I said in my talk, America really, in a sense, has the worst weather in the world. Yep. And uh, we, it, it's, it's so variable at the nature of it, from hurricanes to tornadoes to, to droughts to, to what have you. Uh, that, that we really need to focus on it, I think, more than perhaps we have and uh, more than, than other nations do. Well, they, there's been a lot of talk about climate and weather around here. And when I was young, I just remember uh, people saying that, you know, you can, a lot of people are concerned about weather, the weather and talk about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Uh, now we're being told that we're actually affecting the weather and the long-term climate, which some of us are very skeptical about. Uh, but whatever it is, we do know that uh, uh, weather, for example, in that Galveston, how many people were lost their lives in the Galveston uh, mm -hmm. hurricane? 5,000. 5, uh, this is, uh, yeah, well, so we we're talking about the fact is, with uh, modern technology and satellite technology, space, especially space-based assets, we've been able to sa save thousands and thousands of lives that otherwise would have been lost. And um, I think that we can be proud that our country has invested in this. And uh, I do, um, I remember, well, just one last note, I, 
remember when I first got here, uh, uh, Pre Vice President Gore <clears throat> had a meeting with all of the weathermen that he could put together, and there's a legend about that, that he had them all gather there at the White House for a conference on uh, talking about weather, and uh, uh, the weathermen were supposed to be talking about guys, yes, global warming, but there was a huge storm front that came through while they were there, and it was, the rain was pouring down, but only about two of the weathermen bothered to bring an umbrella to the meeting. And I don't know what that all indicates, but I think that we should pay a lot of attention to, uh, to the weather, so thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Takano, your five minutes for questions. I'll be out there selling umbrellas. That's it. My job. Uh, this is a question for both the gentlemen. Uh, as we consider how to reauthorize weather, weather research, who would you recommend uh, the committee hear from? Um, we have testimony from you, uh, the private firms, represent private firms. Whether the experts or stakeholders, should we take testimony from? I would, I would think uh, the scientific community, um, uh, university community, um, in terms of research. Uh, I think there are, there are models for how other, even how other countries look at this uh, domain uh, that may be useful to hear from. Um, and I think the wealth of private industry, we come from, our two companies come from two different parts of the value chain. Um, my company will produce you know, some of the most advanced, best weather data on the planet. Um, Mr. Meyer's company will use that data downstream um, to inform, you know, citizenry and, and enterprise. Um, there are a variety of people in between that could be useful from a private enterprise perspective to hear from. Mr. Myers? Uh, I, I would agree with that. When you look at the American weather enterprise, uh, we always think of it as a three-legged stool comprised of, of the government assets. Uh, the weather industry uh, in, in a broad sense, as was just described uh, by Mr. Kirshner, and, and the academic and research community. And uh, I, I think it's appropriate to hear from, from all of those with re regard to this uh, to, to get their viewpoint. So you, you, you do not consider yourself uh, of the academic and research community. You, you are, you, um, both of your the authority from which you are able to speak is not academic or research oriented. Um, no, I can speak from a, an authority of sort of commercial data service provision and about the technical aspects of satellite delivery and collection of that data. And and we're a, a, a weather information company, uh, and we don't we don't view ourselves as heavily into the the research uh, uh, aspect of of basic uh, modeling and things of that nature. But you both, you both uh, have a, uh, uh, you both have a, a respect and esteem for the research and uh, scientific community, especially those who um, are recognized experts in the field of, of climate and, and uh, weather research. Um, I, in, indeed, I would say our, our company is founded by a, a gentleman by the name of Tom Young, who is a JPL, uh, was at JPL for 30 years. Um, we are engaged as a company with an organization called uh, LASP, the Laboratory for Atmospheric Space Physics out in Colorado, which is part of the university. Um, so there's no question that we are, as a company, drawing on the very research expertise, both in scientific community and in university community, to help build our company. Do you happen to know your founder's um, um, view on uh, global climate change? Uh, does he take the scientific consensus on global climate change um, seriously or not seriously? Is he a skeptic, a uh, non-skeptic? I cannot speak to that. Um, would you say it's worthwhile to hear from testimony from, uh, from, from NOAA on this, on this bill? I would think it would be quite necessary and appropriate to have the customer who we're dealing with, who's you know, involved in this domain, leading the domain in the United States to be heard from. Um, thank you. I, I yield back the balance of my time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Myers, thank you for AccuWeather. I've got my AccuWeather. <laughs> uh, 
app here on my phone, and I depend upon it greatly. So thank you for the service that you provide. Glad to hear and, that. Thank I, you. I, I'm a pilot, and <coughs> I'm a, I, though I'm not currently flying, and I'm also a hunter and fisherman, and I like to follow y'all's uh, weather forecasting and, and what you have there. But thank you very much. Dr. Cliff Mass, professor of atmospheric studies or sciences at the University of Washington, recently wrote, quote, the politicization, it's hard for the Southerner to pronounce, uh, of climate change also has had a major impact on government resource allocation with bountiful funding going into climate change research, while other areas such as weather prediction are poor cousins. How else can one explain that climate research gets more than 100 times the computer resources provided to weather prediction? with the latter having huge benefits for people today. NOAA administrators have continuously pushed the climate agenda while downplaying weather prediction. This needs to change, unquote. And I could not agree more. Mr. Myers and Mr. Kirshner, do you agree with Dr. Mass's uh, position on this? Well, I know Cliff and he, he tends to state things rather emphatically. Uh, uh, I, I agree that uh, I think we need a reallocation between uh, uh, climate and weather resources. Uh, I, I don't know if I can ascribe uh, reasons to why we have an imbalance the way we do. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm not interested in, in weighing into a uh, maybe quasi-political debate on, on climate change and the causes of it. Uh, whether or not, though, uh, as, as many who, who uh, do support uh, the concerns over climate change state, uh, that weather events have become more severe. And I'm not saying I agree or I don't agree, but if that's the case, uh, that, that suggests that we really should be allocating more resources into looking at what's happening on the weather front. Uh, and so I, I think it's perfectly consistent with anyone's climate position that more money needs to go to weather research, whether it's because there is change that's affecting the weather now or those people who believe that there isn't but we still have severe weather issues that we've got to address. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's actually something that all sides of the political spectrum in, in the climate area should be supporting uh, simply by the very nature of what people believe the climate is causing. Mr. Garshner. Um I'm not intimately, just due to time, not that intimately familiar with all the workings of NOAA. Um, what I can say from being in this business for six months is that my understanding is that the National Weather Service has its primary focus to tend to day-to-day -day weather prediction. Um, what I think it's – there's a, a broader question, though, that I think is worth talking about is what role does weather prediction in the short-term, medium-term, or long-term play in terms of a strategic role in our society and, and economy? And ultimately, we believe that weather is a strategic, of strategic interest to supporting our economy, industry, infrastructure, um, and our company in response to that broad belief um, has you know, developed and will continue to develop products and services that will address the day-to-day -day operational weather interests, um, which are forecasting now to the next 10 days and beyond, um, to space weather. Space weather is that weather that's out on the ionosphere, which is further you know, from the ground, um, but deals with the sun uh, ejecting coronal mass. Um, and then, and indeed, climate. Um, our particular technology, GPSRO, is it, it, both for weather opera operational weather and for climate application is absolute in its, its, its um, uh, establishment of temperature, water pressure, and water vapor, or air pressure and water vapor. It's unique. It does this in such a way that calib uh, calibrates all other forms of data for both long-term climate application and operational weather. And our focus is on providing a suite of those capabilities, whether you're talking about the short-term or the long-term. 
Well, my time expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I agree with Dr. Mass. We've got to put more funds on weather research than we are on climate change. I think we are at allocating those funds in an improper way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Round. Uh, a vote has been called, and in order to provide all members time to ask their questions, I'd like to have, ask witnesses if they'd make themselves available after a short recess. Yes. Thank you. That being the case, then, the committee will reset, recess subject to the call of the chair and without objection. So ordered. The committee stands in recess. The subcommittee on the environment will come to order. To the witness panel, thank you for uh, bearing with, with us as we had uh, other obligations there with our vote. And unfortunately, we've lost some of the members who uh, wanted, to, wanted to have the opportunity to, to ask you questions. So we remind them as other members that they can always submit questions. And if we do, we would appreciate your response within, uh, within a two-week period. Um, we now turn to uh, our, my, my colleague, Mr. Weber, from Texas for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <laughs> really don't know exactly where to begin. My wife and I have this conversation from time to time. Um, the great, a good job to have would be a weather forecaster because you can be wrong so much of the time and still get paid. Uh, so um, I want to ask you guys really about your satellite systems, if you will, some of the more technical aspects, I suspect. Um, first of all, well, let me, get into the, let me get into the monetary side of it maybe. Are either of you aware uh, of competition from foreign companies, I'm talking about from foreign countries, where they would come in and put up a satellite or a system like an AccuWeather, where they can do the kinds of things that we do? I guess what I'm really driving at is what is the pressure, what kind of pressure is there on y'all to be your best, do your best? Or is there pressure in the marketplace? Um, I'll, I'll certainly respond to that. <clears throat> Depending on what uh, industry we're talking about. I actually come out of the communication satellite world where there is a lot of global pressure, global competition uh, that overlaps regions. Um, in the weather domain, so far as I have seen, there's less uh, pressure per se coming for satellite systems. They tend to be over particular regions, over particular countries, um, especially the geosynchronous kind that are 22,000 miles away that are staring at a particular region. Um, the polar orbiting systems, the lower Earth orbit systems um, uh, that cover the globe, um, to my knowledge, there are certainly other country, other, either countries or consortium that have those kinds of systems. The Europeans have uh, those kinds of satellites. Um, what we would love to see more of, frankly, is intense competition, intense uh, commercial competition, not state-funded, uh, necessarily, but uh, privately funded, um, and that's part of what that's part of what my company is here to talk about is how do you know in in this world uh, how do we evolve to a to a, a a model where the weather satellite community is privately funded, not necessarily on the balance sheets of the of the taxpayers, um, and we're looking for hopeful that our customer can migrate to a world of looking to commercial provision of services to, to do that. Uh, today, there is a data buy provision. There are data buy uh, policies that exist, but those data buy policies within NOAA have to do with buying something that exists today. My company has a system that it want, it's planning to deploy, which means I, my company needs to go to the marketplace raise capital, talk to customers about something that we need to start building today that won't be available just due to technology for 18 to 24 months. What we are ultimately looking for are ways to, to change the procurement approach that allow us to get, uh, get contingent commitments um, to say, I will take the data that you're going to provide that meets the specifications of NOAA or Air Force or other agencies, but give that commitment today so that we can begin to build our systems now. That would feed competition 
certainly in the United States, I'm sure we, we ultimately like competition. We want to deliver the best possible service on a highly competitive basis, and we believe that we'll do that if we have that kind of procurement structure in place. Mr. Myers. AccuWeather is uh, really a, a downstream user of satellite information, and, and we're more than happy to see competition in the, in the area. Uh, right now, we uh, receive satellite information mostly from government and government consortiums around the world, including, of course, the, the U.S. satellites, which we read, read directly. Uh, the weather industry itself in the United States is very competitive. Uh, and and worldwide, uh, that's true as well. There are a number of uh, robust uh, weather companies in in Korea, in in uh, China, in uh, uh, Japan, and in Europe. Uh, at at this point, and we compete with them on a on a worldwide basis. So I, I think the uh, the competitive landscape is 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 good. I think it's a huge advantage that the United States has, though, that the American weather industry is really ahead of the rest of the world, uh, and, and some of the things that we're talking about in terms of enhanced research, I think we should realize get leveraged in a very great way because there is such an industry, so it does not only benefit the, the government and the ability for the government to issue warnings, but it, it benefits all those downstream who can make use of, of the information, the modeling, and what have you. Uh, to provide specialized services and, and even general public services on websites and mobile devices and so forth to the public. Okay, I see I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I do have other questions. I don't, are you going to go round two, hopefully? Uh, no, Mr. Weber, we actually don't anticipate doing that. But you're free to take as much time here if you need additional time. Well, thank you. Then let me ask uh, this question then. So having said that about the pressure to be as good as you can be and, and looking forward to see you know, what, what kind of policies we can put into place to, set, to make sure we're get, uh, taxpayers are getting the most bang for their buck, a um, couple of questions. Number one is more technical in nature about the ability of a satellite to look out into the uh, – if you're looking at a hurricane that's forming over in the Atlantic and coming off the Atlantic coast – I mean the African coast, for example – uh, what kind of time uh, degree of predictability is there? Can you predict with any degree of certainty three days, five days, seven days? I guess, Mr. Myers? It depends on the uh, weather regime that, that uh, is, is occurring at that particular time. Uh, some storms are more predictable than others as a, as a result. So I, I can't give you a, a definitive answer to that. Uh, Can you give me a window? Is it three to five days? Is it one to three days? <clears throat> well, the, it, further, the further out you go, the, the bigger the, the cone. We've, we've all seen those cones. Sure. The weather service and, and the weather companies all but issue. You, but surely you've got statistics, and that was my follow-up question. How far back does your data go to say that we've had a degree of success in predicting these weather events by 30 percent, 60 percent, 90 percent, going back as far as 10 years or 20 years? There are statistics that do go back uh, that far, and generally they indicate that the predictability has increased significantly, uh, that the, the cones have, have narrowed, uh, the, the accuracy going out has, has increased. I don't have those statistics here uh, with me to, to refer to, uh, but they, they uh, have certainly improved significantly. What I might what I might add is that, um, as I said earlier, the te the technology world that we are in is 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 predominantly about looking, evaluating, gathering data that's going to tell you what's going to happen. Other technologies such as geosynchronous uh, satellites tell you what really focus on what is happening right now and near term warnings. But two examples that I one I mentioned earlier and the other one I'll, I'll give in addition. The technology that we work with is GPS RO radio occultation. It, it has been proven or it's been studied within NOAA as well as other organizations that, that we can, that data can tell you four days out that something's going to happen eight hours sooner. We can tell you eight days out that we, we can give you a 15 hour additional heads up on a hurricane as an example or severe weather that might be coming. So those hours are precious, absolutely precious to the forecast community, 
uh, to predict what's going to happen. The, the other example that I would give, which I, if I had a camera or a picture I could show you, is that the GPS RO data, it, looking back at a, a Hurricane Ernesto back in 2006, um, this was done by UCAR, um, actually visibly shows in, in simulation where with GPS RO data, you can see a storm that without it, you could not see 54 hours, 78 hours, and 102 hours. So there's actually me mechanisms, and this technology does this, that enables with other data, I'm not going to, it's not alone, it is with the other suite of data sources we have, but with GPS RO data, you can see things further in advance that you wouldn't have been able to see without it. And again, that's about bringing forward, be, be, bringing forward the ability to see and forecast that in a portfolio of analyzing weather, you would want to grab every hour and every minute you could. Recognizing the time is short now, Mr. Weber. Are you yeah, thank, thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. And uh, since we had uh, additional time over here to the minority side, would you request any additional time for, for further questions? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, to the witnesses, again, thank you for your valuable testimony and, and to the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the committee, as I mentioned previous, may have additional questions for you as witnesses, and we ask you to respond to those in writing if that's the case. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and from written questions from members. I'd also like to note that the ranking member, my colleague from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, and I have had an opportunity to discuss the minority's request for a, a rule, House Rule 11 hearing. We have agreed to hold a subsequent hearing with two witnesses from both the minority and the majority parties. I look forward to inviting a representative from NOAA as one of our witnesses to be a part of the witness panel. And we will work with all parties to schedule this uh, most important second hearing on this topic at the nearest available time. And as a result of that agreement, the minority has agreed to withdraw their request for a Rule 11 hearing. Uh, with that, uh, the witnesses are excused, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.